Good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's great to be here, part of this event here in Paris. My name is Asha. I'm a journalist, and I cover themes around sustainable mobility. It's a great pleasure to be here today, and welcome to all my colleagues from the media who are in the room here. And I know that some of you are behind your screens joining us online, so make sure you keep your questions handy because we will have a Q&A session, of course, at the very end. But before we begin, let's probably start with some context first, and uh, it's no news to anyone. As you know, climate change is accelerating the need for electrification transition. On top of that, you know, the future CO2 emission regulations in front freight transport and access to cities are actually radically transforming the logistics ecosystems, while we know e-commerce is booming. So what's more, the electric van market is set to grow by an impressive 40% a year, it already started between 2022 to 2030. So a new market is emerging and to seize this opportunity. And this is also one of the reasons why we are all here today. So Volvo Group, Renault Group and CMA CGM are indeed joining forces and become pioneers in this new market in an all new generation of fully electric vans and unprecedented associated services. We will talk about it straight away. I think it's time to begin. So let's, uh, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming on stage the president and CEO of Volvo Group, Martin Lundstedt, the CEO of CMA CGM, Rodolf Sade, and Luca Dimio, the CEO of Renault Group. Please join me, gentlemen. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you for joining me. It's great to see all you three together. Usually I see you just uh, individually, but it's good to see you together. <laughs> right, thank, thank you anyway for bringing all us together. I will start with you maybe, Luca. So let's end the suspense with Flexis. So what's behind, tell us more. I mean, first of all, I think uh, this thing is a, a revolutionary, let's say, project. And at the heart of it is a re revolutionary product. I remember when I came to Renault 2020, I had one of the first meetings, probably the first meeting I had with the commercial vehicle team, uh, you know, in, uh, um, in San Frederic, where they have their, their headquarter and their development center. And they showed me a chart that was showing 50 years of development of commercial vehicle on the different segments, small, medium, and, and large. And I look at the chart, and basically you had exactly the same thing for 50 years. So I said to the guys, but you, you guys are doing the same thing since 50 years. 50 years. And this is a typical situation when, uh, where there is space for disruption. At the same time, you had uh, you know, projects like Rivian or projects like Arrival that were popping up left and right. And I said, okay, why don't we try to do people that have 100 years experience of commercial vehicle to reinvent ourselves and to really change the game. And that's the, the way it started. And then, uh, you know, my, my obsession for, you know, kind of team sport to collective horizontal approach. So I talked to, about it to, to Martin. And I remember Rodolphe coming, you know, for, you know, a chat on, in my office. And it took me like 20 minutes to convince him to get into the thing. That was very reassuring because these guys, they know about business. So they're not going to put chips on things that, uh, you know, that don't have a chance to work. So that's what it is. It's a revolutionary thing. We change everything. Electric skate platform, new electronic architecture, completely different concept of the body. So this is, uh, you know, maybe if I, maybe it's a kind of a Tesla of the, of the commercial vehicle in a way, right? That's the way you have to see it. All right, and of course, three champions behind it. But but may, maybe look at if we took a closer if we took a closer look at the product itself. Yeah. A few words about that. Look, it's uh, okay. it's a family of products. Okay, so you have the let's say the classical vans, uh, etc., and the things that you can completely transform because there is a revolutionary, I would say, way of building Lego like uh, you know different customization, transformation of the thing, quick, okay. In a big plant in Sandouville, we announced the Friday that the car, w the, the car will be produced there. And as part of the range, you have uh, a really unique uh, product that doesn't exist, which we call stepping van. 
you will see some shade of the thing uh, mm -hmm. later. But this is, uh, you know, a, a car that uh, basically is designed for, uh, you know, last mile delivery. And uh, it's, uh, it's done for that. It's very tall. It's very short. So it's the size of a kangoo. Or that means a small van. It has the cargo capacity of, the, of a mid van. It turns like a car, like, you know, because you don't have the engine in the front. And, uh, you, and, and the, the fact that we, uh, let's say, have, are changing completely the content of the car, especially electronic architecture, this will be the first car of uh, the Renault Group where uh, now it's, it's shared with between us, but the first product on which we will implement the uh, software-defined vehicle, right? And that means connection to the cloud, you can update, you can, uh, you know, you can update the function, is evolutionary, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just like, you know, something that doesn't exist. The whole, I, the, the whole project has been driven by the idea that we should be able, mm -hmm. through the concept of the car, to the electronic architecture, to the whole thing that we are going to do together, to reduce the cost, the total cost of usage of the product by 30%. Now, if you imagine that in the life cycle of a product, or the such kind of product, people spend between 100 and 120,000 euro mm -hmm. to pay for the gasoline, to pay for maintenance, to pay for insurance, et cetera, et cetera. If you reduce that by 30%, it means that basically the people will be able to buy the car for free. And that's the revolution of the thing, right? So we are fighting hard, but I think it's a good example on how the European automotive, uh, you know, truck, uh, you know, logistic uh, industry is uh, kind of moving into attack mode reinventing mm -hmm. itself and playing collective. You know how much I'm, you know, I'm fond of this kind of things. And this is a very right. clear materialization of, mm -hmm. of, of the idea that I think will be one of the ways to get Europe back, you know, in a competitive we'll, position. We'll, we'll talk about that. Thank yeah. you, Luca. To, to transition, maybe uh, playing collective, what Luca just said. So why this joint venture, Martin? Why did you have to create this joint venture. I mean, you've done many things alone in the past, yeah. so why, why do this now? <coughs> and, uh, first and foremost, uh, I would li just like to say it's great to be here in Paris and to be together with um, both uh, teams here, all, all, all the three of us. Uh, but to start with, I think, I mean, uh, when we look into the logistics sector and uh, all the, the downstream customers, but also customers' customers, I mean, decarbonization is everything. Climate cannot wait. But at the same time, and we have seen that so many cases, and I think uh, COVID in that aspect uh, made it clear that we cannot live without very professional logistics. And logistics will continue to increase in volumes because you have all the mega trends when it comes to urbanization, when it comes to e-commerce, when it comes to uh, growing populations, uh, etc. Uh, but it must be considerably more sustainable in all different aspects. And all of us, we are working hard on that uh, together with our ecosystems and customers. Uh, but what we see, I mean, if you take Volvo Group as one example, I mean, 2040, everything that we deliver globally, and we are in 190 countries, right, uh, should be fossil free. Uh, and then it's fossil free when it comes to input material, when it comes to propulsion system, when it comes to products in use. Uh, <coughs> and that means that you need to move a brown fossil based platform ecosystem to a green uh, sustainable platform, mm -hmm. and you cannot do it alone. Partnership is truly the new leadership, and the equation is easy. You can have great equipment, but if you don't have that times infrastructure, times green energy, times TCO, times uh, sust uh, sustainable supply chain mm -hmm. with scaling capacity, it will not happen. Uh, and I'm deliberately saying times everything, because if one of these parameters are zero, it is zero. And that is tend to be forgotten, actually. And, and therefore, we need to partner up, and we need to be open how to do that. And what we see now with our customer base, we mm -hmm. are uh, one of the top three global players in, in heavy duty and medium duty, uh, proud, uh, proud owners of Renault trucks. We have a great partnership with, with Renault already, as you know, on the LCV side. What we see now is that the S-curves are accelerating, and urban distribution, distribution and last mile delivery is being one of the key pioneers. 
not only when it comes to the last mile in itself, but it's starting from the hub to hub. It's starting actually from the port, uh, Rodolf, right? And then all the way through mm. until the last mile. And we wanted to have a platform that we can continue to build on, a software platform, because this is not the product-centric. It's a fantastic product, hardware and software, but it is a system revolution right. uh, where we can connect the dots. And, and this is, I mean, I mean, just take e-commerce, it will be 13% growth annually up to mm -hmm. 2026 globally, and that's huge. I mean, if you really add on, uh, so we are trying to combine, and this will be a challenge, but we will manage because we are so firmly committed to that, uh, the combination of the two, best of the two worlds, right. a flexible, agile, time to market set up with flexes, pulling all the opportunities that uh, these three companies are sitting on in terms of scalability, industrialization, customer base, service network, um, uh, all uh, connectivity and fleet management. Fantastic. So, uh, you know, it yeah. will be rock and roll. Fantastic. <laughs> so we'll, we'll keep an eye on that, Martin. So two OEM leaders plus logistic champions. Again, a uh, really unique combination there. So to reflect back on what Luca was saying, Rudolf, the 20 minutes you spent in, in, in Luca's office was very convincing. He was very convincing. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what really motivated you, Rodolf, to team up with uh, Volvo and Renault? Maybe one may say, what is a shipping company doing in a car maker press conference? That was and the I initial question I wanted to ask. <laughs> yes. So maybe what I will do is I will try to answer it. Uh, first of all, as a shipping company and a logistic provider, we are... Uh, very mindful of what happens to decarbonization, especially in our industry. So we have taken quite a lot of bold commitments to reduce our CO2 emissions. First of all, is to become carbon neutral in 2050 and at the same time reduce our greenhouse emissions from now till uh, 2050, which is also quite a challenge. Number two is we also operate a logistic company and this logistic company is uh, using electrical vehicles. And when Luca in 20 minutes said, why don't you join in? I said, with pleasure, you could make me a good price on the vehicles <laughs> we will be buying from you. <laughs> and then and we're good to go. Uh, but I I it is true that, especially in nowadays, if we manage to find a solution to reduce our uh, CO2 emissions, be it in shipping, in logistics, and especially when it comes to electrical vehicles, I believe it makes quite a lot of sense. And we have also set up a, a fund uh, with a win billion five to be invested in decarbonization of shipping uh, and logistics, and this is the fund that we will be using to uh, invest alongside Ono and Volvo. You, you want to say a quick word about the fund? Sure. Um, during the COVID days, uh, we have been looking at many ways on how to reduce our CO2 emissions. And we have looked at many projects. As uh, we were quite profitable during this period, we have decided to set up this fund uh, with an amount of 1.5 billion euros to be invested, especially in decarbonization of shipping and logistics. So uh, investing in Flexus is quite the, the flagship of the investments we will be making on the Pulse, and we look forward to growing and developing more investments alongside right. the decarbonization. Thank you, Rodolf. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so look at after what has been said about Flexis, I imagine that Flexis can be seen, and you mentioned it yourself, as this great European asset serving the sovereignty of this the European automotive industry. This is what you, you mentioned earlier a little bit. Can you expand a little bit on that? But I look, I mean, I have, I have to say, it's, it's, I'm very proud to, you know, be standing here with uh, two great companies. And actually, the most exciting thing is that actually they are not exactly of the same, you know, industry or kind of, you know, or segments that we are. That shows that uh, some of the issue, which has, I've always said in the last years and months, et cetera, is that some of the challenges where we have like decarbonization or you know or digital revolution these are topics that require that are actually cutting industries and even functions in the companies horizontally right mm -hmm. so you need you need to be able to partner you can of course the, you have the choice to do everything by yourself right so so called vertical integration it's a model but what we're trying to apply is uh, is actually an horizontal model where we we try to partner with the best to solve the problem. 
And by doing that, we share the risk, we have a better quality of capital allocation, but we also learn every day because nobody knows logistics better than the team of Rodolphe. Right. We don't know, we are not into this thing. We're gonna get a lot of learnings through, and through the process and we're gonna readapt the product to serve his needs. Mm -hmm. And the same thing goes with you know, the experience that uh, a, car comp a truck company like Volvo that is much more oriented to service downtime except than people right. selling passenger cars. We're going to learn a lot of things. They're going to put a lot of things. So we put everything we can do in the basket. So this is a very good example. I think there is no project like this in Europe. We see a couple of things, of course, in the US, which I mentioned, a couple of things in Asia. But there is absolutely no project on the horizon uh, like this one. And, uh, and you know, I think that uh, Europe has to demonstrate capacity of uh, disrupting things. I think we are, in general, a place where you know, logistics is very critical. It's very complex with a lot of countries, etc. I mean, mm. Rodolphe could come and better than me. And so it's the perfect home turf to actually, as right. a, you know, to prove that we can you know, reinvent the thing, starting from the hardware, because we are, we are hardware companies, right? So I think there is a way to come to the problem from the hardware side. And uh, yeah, um, as I said, it's a, it's a very good example of uh, you know Euro European companies you know trying to play champions, not, not even ch world uh, world championship, and uh, and I'm very excited and I'm very proud of being there with Martin and and, and Rodolf. It's a Thank it's you. a great moment. Thank you, Luca. Let's let's talk about customers uh, a little bit. Uh, how, Rodolf, maybe, uh, how does your expertise in logistics ensure that the Flexi truck meets customers' demand, you know, the, the needs, actually? Um, I think maybe, uh, if you allow me, if I go back to what Luca was saying about joining forces, the three of us, I very much believe also in partnership, especially between three European companies. I mean, we, look, we talk a lot about old Europe, but here we give you a good example that it's also New Europe that is building up this partnership. We're talking about decarbonization, we're talking about electrical vehicles, and the fact that this Flexus uh, initiative will allow us as a logistic company to utilize about 1,500 to begin with uh, utility trucks that will be able to uh, go around cities uh, without uh, emitting any CO2 emissions, that would be quite remarkable. Brilliant. Uh, Martin, same thing, uh, the lives of customers. This is really how it's going to improve the lives of customers. With yeah, but first and foremost, I think, I mean, it has been said both by, by Luca and Rodolf. I mean, if you look at our customer base around the globe, uh, I mean, the absolute majority are professional logistical companies, but they are actually uh, operating in all different type of sectors. And that is the beauty, obviously. I mean, uh, in order really to meet their demands, uh, you need to be an application uh, specialist, uh, really understand the operation downstream. And if you look at the merging uh, corporate, so to speak, demands coming up now, of course, we talk a lot about the societal requirements in terms of regulation, city bans, and so on, etc. But the reality is that the big driver would be the corporate sector. Is because companies like ourselves, by the way, but mm -hmm. also a lot downstream, it could be in the retail sector, it could be in mining, it could be in, I mean, automotive, uh, have their own science-based targets. Up to 2025, it's, I should say, uh, it's a directional target, it's not material, it's like minus 15% or something like that. But 2030, when we have gone through in Volvo Group all the 8,000 global companies that have actually adhered to the science-based targets, then you're talking about minus 50, minus 60 percent. And in order to get there, regardless if you're a miner, or if you're a retailer, or if you're a car manufacturer, or if you're a shipping company, you need to address your own logistics. And that you need to do in a system end-to-end -end view. And that, I mean, we were out uh, yesterday, had a great meeting with one of the biggest players in logistics in Europe. They were talking about their end-to-end -end design, where the last mile is just a very important link of what is coming through the whole end-to-end -end structure. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the outcome here, um, e-commerce growing, logistics growing, yes, it is about decarbonization, but it's also about noise reduction. Right. It is about ergonomics. Uh, we have been traveling ourselves with uh, the drivers that are heroes actually delivering our parcels to ourselves and seeing how the planning cycle looks like. Mm. 
everything here can be combined with the joint expertise that we are sitting on together with the customers. And the software defined vehicle that Luca was alluded to provides a safe, a secure digital stack, but that is not closed. Because on top of that, you can really do the customization right. based on the different type of mm -hmm. uh, services that we are sitting on for their specific need. Because it will not be, you know, uh, you can get uh, any color you like as long as it's black. You know, that was back mm -hmm. in the days. Now it's about exact customization, but combining that with scale. Because so far in this sector, we have seen a lot of initiatives, but not anyone that has been able to actually pull the resources out. And Flexis is an asset light structure, but with a fantastic uh, uh, pool of resources that they can uh, pull from. I mean, with all the expertise the Renault, Renault Group is having in, in light commercial vehicles, in industrialization, uh, all the expertise that we have from Rodolphe and the team when it comes to logistics and what are the demands. And, and also from, from the Volvo Group, also of course, network, provide services, etc., customer base. So, uh, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Can I say one thing? Uh, yes, Luca. <laughs> La, to, just to build on, uh, on, on what Martin said, just a couple of information or, you know, underlining a few things. One is, there is a tendency sometimes in the conversation, we also, also do this, like to confuse the CO2 issue with the uh, pollution, mm -hmm. okay? A CO2 is a global problem. Pollution is uh, very concentrated in urban areas. So where, the, where, where it really hurts in terms of noise, in terms of uh, smoke, et cetera, et cetera, and then particles is the urban area. And th that product will, is designed to actually solve this thing. This is where it hurts, yeah. okay? Second information. W uh, just to make a f simple example of what it means to have, at the same time, agile project, uh, you know, company, project structure, uh, versus and, and combination with the strength of the companies. In distribution, okay, we will sell those vehicles with Renault brand through the Renault distribution network. I think we have 5,000 only in Europe, okay, of them. So as much as we sell Trafic or Master, et cetera, our dealers will continue. Part of it will be sold to Renault trucks, uh, you know, Volvo trucks uh, thing. We might have some opportunities within our, for example, our alliance to have some other customers so mm -hmm. they can buy products. And then we will dedicate a line of product that is actually a combination between product and software and service package. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a kind of white label thing. It's designed for the big customers where they don't only want the product, but they want a combination of a product plus the transformation, plus the software, right. you know, because you have to connect the, the, the system, plus some microservice that they w will want to have. And last information is, remember that this will be the first product in which we will, you know, try to implement the software-defined vehicle thing. And this thing is designed with Qualcomm and with Google. That means it is based on Android. And you can... When you do a, your own electronic architecture, you probably have two, three, five thousand engineers coding the OS of the thing. This is designed by Google on Android, and you have six million people on the planet that can, not two or three thousand or five thousand, six million people on the planet that can code an Android operational system. So you imagine the possibility, you know, of people adding services for the, because yeah. they are from the big company, so they, you have, they have coders, they have software engineers, so they can code the thing and add on that. Okay. That's the idea also. Yeah, it's again horizontal, <laughs> right? Thank you, Luca. And, and uh, Rudolf, Martin, uh, and Luca, you're coming back for the Q&A, but if you allow me, bear with me for two seconds, because we're going now to welcome the two persons who are here with us, to whom you have entrusted the keys, leading the next stage of the Flexis adventure. Please join me in welcoming Philippe Divry and Krishnan Sundarajan. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Uh, we will see, of course, R Rudolf uh, Luca 
and Martin later on, and now uh, Philip and uh, Krishnan. Maybe for people who don't know you guys, look, maybe just uh, a quick word about you. Philip, correct me if I'm wrong. So you had a long career at Volvo in France, Sweden, and India. You've led several industrial and commercial businesses, but also have an extensive experience with joint ventures and strategic partnerships. And Krishnan, as for yourself, you're an automotive professional with experience of running vehicle programs with different geographies spanning across Asia, US and Europe. And like Philip yourself, passionate in setting up this project that's moving into a new chapter and that's a great adventure. So maybe my first question, so I'm sure you are impatient, both of you, to lead this uh, next step. But what spontaneously comes to your mind when you think about the journey which led to Flexis, Philip? Well, I shall first I'd like to thank our founders for their trust and support and for their visionary strategy towards this booming market opportunity that we talked about. You know, I've been in this industry for many years and I always heard customers telling me logistic, urban logistics, they are 20% of the ton kilometers, but they are actually half the cost. And when you listen to them, an even greater share of the complexity because that's a difficult environment to operate in and they have to constantly increase the efficiency of their operations, reduce cost, improve quality. And now on top of that, they have this new challenge of energy transition and decarbonization. And what they told us is that so far, no one has brought them the full solution to this problem. That's why when we created Flexis, we decided to build it on three pillars. First, the innovative breakthrough vehicle platform. Second, a wide portfolio of B2B efficiency services. And third, a dedicated customer interface. And it's those three things together that form a radically new value proposition to help our customers make their urban logistic operations cleaner, and more efficient at the same time. Brilliant, thank you for that, Philip. Maybe uh, just a quick word about the three pillars. Um, what's really behind them? So maybe the first one, Krishnan, on the new vehicle platform. Yeah, so this, this platform is uh, very innovative. It's uh, grounded up is a native BEV, electric vehicle, and it's a skateboard, and you are able to adapt multiple body types, which means you're going to become more and more friendly to the customers. The per se, the car is running in 800 volt system, which means uh, you're able to top up the energy in a rapid pace, and that's something very important for the B2B. It comes with two types of battery to the different cluster needs of the customer. Then the brain of the car, which is the software, and this is going to be the first car, which will be the software-driven car, Android OS, and we have been working with the different logistics company to understand that what are the services that should make this software enabler and great. But in the last two and a half years, we have been with many customers, retail and wholesale customers, logistic customer, and we have chiseled and fine-tuned the product and the services to the need that will make it as a breakthrough. Last but not the least, the important thing is the team with the know-how is the knowledge capital that we are going to embark into this Flexis. I'm really excited to make this happen. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you, Krishnan. And, and ma it may be, Philip, quick word about the two other pillars, which were services and the organization. Yeah, I think services, Martin and Lucas spoke about them. You have a lot of efficiency services for professional companies which exist in other segments or in other industries. But so far, those services were not available for vans. And we're going to change that now with the new electronic architecture that will make vans into connected devices into our customers' systems. And that means that not only they will have access to those services, they will be able to connect the vehicle to their own fleet management, transport management systems, and we will be able also to customize that to their exact needs. But in order to do this, and that's the third pillar, Asha, we realized that we also needed a new organization because it's not the traditional type of ordinary sales relationship, it's project sales. And to do this, our founders once again have been visionary. They have dared to disrupt themselves by creating Flexis as a new independent company. An independent company 
that will have expert teams able to engage into this dialogue with the customer and tailor the solution to their needs. So and uh, I would say, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. No, I think uh, I think I would stop here. Ju just, just maybe one final question, Philip. What's next now? Where are you headed? Well, we are starting operating now, and uh, we have a team coming from Renault, Volvo, and other companies. We are going to do two things immediately. First of all, we are going to intensify the dialogue with our customers to go into more detail about mm -hmm. the solutions. The second thing is that we will keep looking for other partners, additional partners. It can be strategic partners, it can be financial, it can be technology and software partners to expand our offer and accelerate our growth. So, um, so delivery is coming up in very soon? Yeah, very soon. But you know, we're starting deliveries uh, in two years, so we'll have time to give you more updates. And I will be pleased to meet all of you again within a few months to give you more details about how we are going to transform urban logistics and deliver the future. Fantastic, really looking forward to that. Thank you, Krishnan and uh, Philip for that. So in a couple of minutes, we'll be taking your questions, so keep them handy with uh, Luca Martin and Rodolfo will be joining us here. Uh, but before that, maybe just a quick glimpse of what the vehicles will look like. <laughs> Right, so as you can see, that was really a sneak peek and that hopefully will want you to ask more questions. Let me now welcome back on stage Luca, Martin and Rodolf for the Q&A session. Thank you for joining, gentlemen. All right, I think we have enough room for everyone here. Fantastic, so there you go. Uh, so uh, who wants to ask the first question? We have a gentleman here. Um, if you have head mics. Hopefully, let's go for it. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Olivier Bertali from uh, Le Point magazine from France. Uh, a question for uh, Rodolphe Sade, please. Uh, do you uh, intend and do you plan to increase your investment if it's successful in Flexus? And May you comment a little more about the strategic investment for, uh, for your group in that enterprise, please? That I, I think 20 minutes, 120 million euros is quite a lot of money. <laughs> so I believe that from where I stand, what I, I would like to see is that we meet the requirements, that we meet the deadline of delivery of 2026, and also most importantly is we deliver a competitive utility truck. Uh, as to the strategy, as I have said in my uh, speech, is I very much believe in decarbonization and decarbonization using new technologies. Uh, we are a logistic company as well as shipping, and in logistics, we need to also use uh, electrical trucks that allows us to reduce our CO2 emissions. And the concept that has been proposed by Luca meets uh, our, our requirements, and that is why I believe this makes quite a lot of sense, and I'm very eager to get this started. Brilliant. Thank you, Odal. Thank you for that great question. Um, we have questions. Oh, we get to you. We'll hold on. Can you rise, please? Yes, Thank hello. you. Thank hello. you. It's working. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hello, Guillaume from Reuters. Uh, I've got two questions. Uh, my first question would be uh, on wi which brand will be uh, the vans uh, sold? Will they be uh, under the Renault, Renault Trucks brand? Could they be sold under a white uh, label for other companies? Uh, will Flexis be also a commercial name for future vans? And the, 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 the tour de table you've been presenting today, is it definitive? Or are you open to other partners? Thank you. I'm going to try to answer this one. Uh, so as I said, for sure with Renault, for sure with the uh, Renault trucks, right? Uh, you have Volvo in or, or not? No, no, the, the Volvo brand is, uh, yeah, v Renault trucks. Uh, we, had, we, are, we have discussion with, uh, with Nissan uh, as, as, as much as they buy already, you know, our commercial vehicle, you know, whether it's the Kangoo or, or, the, or, the, or, the, or the Master. So we will, uh, we will uh, maybe take also advantage of that. There's another possibility to sell. 
uh, and uh, and we will also have a white label. Uh, I'm, uh, Flexi is the is the actually legal name of the thing. Uh, we have to see if we take uh, this name as a commercial name or we change it. But this is not a big uh, big thing. But the idea is we'll for sure have a part of the cars that are sold really in the logic of the white label because it's a combination of the product and the services and the thing. So this is also the very innovative. Imagine that you have. I don't want to mention company because, uh, but big companies that want their own transformation of the thing, their own uh, microservices in because they have they have to connect the system to their software system, etc. We're going to design car for them, right? We have the possibility. You, some of you were in uh, Sandoville uh, <coughs> Friday. You see that we have space. We have a lot of capacity, uh, and but we also have competence, you know, to do things. You know, commercial vehicle, like, it's actually a very, very complicated, uh, let's say, business, uh, you know, from a manufacturing point of view. So this is also an uh, element. So what I'm trying to say is that we are probably in the condition to really do volumes, still doing a revolutionary thing, because we do commercial vehicles <laughs> since 100 years. It's not easy. See it, see it other competitors that are coming up in that segment that they came up in the last year. I mean, they had to face a lot of challenges when it came to simply the production of the thing, right? Mm -hmm. And we can do it uh, at scale, we can do it very competitive in terms of cost, mm -hmm. that's a part of the story. Are we open to other things? I mean, I, I don't think that none of our company have a problem to finance completely the thing. Right now, we have no issue. We are in the process of development of, of the car. We have the cash and the money secured mm -hmm. to the project company. But uh, if, uh, you know, the, you know, by definition, this thing is open because the most beautiful thing that could happen is that product like this becomes some form of a standard in Europe, where the product is an excuse, is the ecosystem, is the connection, is the logistic system, the software system is behind. And I think that Europe deserves, needs such kind of thing, right? Because uh, we have engaged into the Green Deal. One of the issues, you know, to lower down, uh, you know, pollution in, uh, in, uh, in, in the urban environment. And this is going to be a tool uh, to do that mm. because uh, that's the playing field of uh, such kind of cars. So we are very open, uh, you know, we are very open to, to that, to Thanks. industrial investors, to financial investors. Thanks, Luca. <coughs> and, Thanks. And ma maybe if I yes, can add uh, Martin, uh, to, to Luca, I, I think, I mean, first and foremost, 100% aligned with what Luca is saying. I think the good news is that, I mean, uh, when you're starting venture like this uh, that has uh, I think an operating model that is super interesting in terms of because often you talk about I mean the it's so to speak the uh, the difference between agility speed flexibility on one axis and then you have so to speak scale or non scale or is it a niche product here actually we can combine the two and that goes, of course, for the product and for the industrialization, but also goes for the global reach. The reality is that uh, if we combine, uh, I mean, the, the different investors as we have it today, we have the global reach. Mm. And then depending on what is the right type of setup for different regions when we go there. I mean, we start in Europe, obviously, to lead the way there. But that will also be a fantastic opportunity to build out globally, Latin America, we have a very strong hold together in Brazil and others. Uh, North America, we are strong with different brands, etc. So I think it's good to keep it open. The good news is that we have the Renault brand in common that we can start with now, and then we have all the different opportunities. But I think you should have that in mind that really combine the, the two worlds here, the startup and the corporate, uh, keep that type of setup will uh, serve us well. And we don't have a volume issue. We already have the backbone scale in the whole value chain from supply, from industrialization, from product knowledge, from services, from service network, from customer base. Uh, and, and build on that scale, but keep the speed and flexibility is the name of the game. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. We had a question here in the front row. Uh, yes, we have. Raising up this time out from AFP, French Press Agency. Um, in, uh, it's a question about the price. Uh, electric trucks are still a bit more expensive than their diesel equivalents. When will it start to, when will we reach price parity with this product? And also, let's talk about margins. Um, at which volume, volume does it get interesting for you? 
you're, you're asking a, a very standard question for a revolutionary project, right? <laughs> of course, very so. orthodox question standard. for an unorthodox project. I mean, I think for sure this thing will be, uh, you know, uh, as a, uh, from a price point of view, let's say, more expensive than uh, <laughs> traffic with a diesel engine. But uh, <laughs> traffic with diesel engine, maybe in 10 years' time, they will not be allowed to enter city center, right? We already have, like, at least 35 zero emission zone planned in Europe, and that's a solution for that. I mean, say that, uh, maybe you were not there before, but I mentioned that the, the key thing is not the price list, is the business case that we are providing to the customer with the, with the total cost of ownership that is 20 to 30 percent lower than conventional product. And, you know, these guys are not looking at, uh, because they are professional, mm. you know, customer, they don't look at the lease price. They look at the cost of ownership and the cost of usage. And that's, the, that's where we can be really radical, right? And uh, in terms of margin, I mean, I'm not going to comment on margin, but we wouldn't do it if this project would not be profitable. And I for sure would not have, <laughs> let's say, convinced either <laughs> Rodolphe <laughs> or, or Marty to come in something to, you know. Even to if you have good coffee in your office, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even if the coffee is very good, <laughs> that would be not enough. So that's a good sign. I mean, that's a interesting, and let's say, it's a sign that this thing is a healthy project, right? It's a healthy okay. project. And we and have to do a lot of work, and <coughs> two years to go, we have to hit the cost, et cetera, et cetera. But we won't do a dilutive project that I don't know for sure, and I'm sure that it's even more true for, for CMA, CGM, and uh, Volvo Trucks. Yeah, and, and I mean, just to complement what Lucas said, I mean, we have been in, in serial production for medium duty and heavy duty, uh, both with Renault and Volvo now, uh, since uh, 2018 19. And it was actually Blendville here in France uh, that was first out, as you remember. And we see exactly what uh, Luca is saying. First and foremost, obviously, because there are certain, I mean, regulatory uh, conditions. Cities will lead the way. They will just ban uh, combustion because uh, it, it's about pollution, as Luca said. But secondly, what is interesting to see is that when you really uh, do uh, this type of setup, you plan it in a different way. Because the reality is that uh, the last mile deliveries are highly unmature still when it comes to planning, when it comes to ergonomics, when it comes to you know, turnaround times, uh, and also when it comes to the energy uh, optimization. Because since these are a professional B2B production equipment uh, type of uh, uh, situations, uh, you will also uh, optimize the whole depot char because the majority will be depot charging, right? And here you can do a lot when it comes to the energy arbitrage uh, and, and again the whole service layer in order to optimize it. So I'm optimistic mm -hmm. about it in relation to these. And, and on top of that, you will have carbon pricing, both corporate and public. But more importantly for us, when we have looked into this, it's not if it, it will be, because it will be competitive with diesel or, or gasoline, etc. So don't worry about that. But, will it, be, but we, will it be the best in the world in this space? Because we have a tendency to talk about, I mean, comparing that with diesel, but we need to be best in the world when it comes to these type of solutions. Mm -hmm. Because those, this is the, and that is what we are aiming for. Maybe one thing, <laughs> maybe one thing is like to, to, to make it... Uh, <laughs> Profitability, right? If you do something that is good for your customer, you make money, right? And I remember with Krishna at the beginning, we were trying to get every second out of interaction between the driver and the product out because maybe 30 seconds that you save mm. in a delivery, yeah. m we, we estimate it's 1% profitability yeah. for a logistic operator. Absolutely. So you get into the car from the side, you don't have to go back and open the door. You, everything is, you know, you have, you have mechanism to, you know, to, to, to order the packages based on the routing. Uh, you know, everything will be like this because 30 seconds is 1% profitability. If you say one minute, it's two. And I mean, logistics, I think it can be profitable, but also it's a very tough business. So mm -hmm. the margins, uh, you know, are relatively, you know, uh, small. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this kind of solution are fantastic right, right how can you and how can you prepack it yeah. i mean now you're carrying it in i mean pause i mean travel maybe a day and uh, you will see potential maybe hold off <laughs> quick word uh, yes maybe to add on what uh, luca and martin said i think two key things from my side is delivery dates 
um, we did not speak about competition coming from Asia. Mm -hmm. And we know that they are very bullish when it comes to building electrical cars and also electrical trucks. Mm -hmm. So the sooner we can deliver Flexis uh, in early days of 2026, the better it is. And also the cost, before talking about profitability, let mm -hmm. us make sure that we build a competitive electrical truck. I'm playing the bad guy here, mm -hmm. but this is my role as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're, no, you're I think, absolutely right. I think we have two questions in the front row, please. Uh, we have one here, and then the lady over there. Oh, yeah. uh, Abertina Torsali from uh, Bloomberg. I think you anticipated my question. I think the elephant in the room is a bit the Chinese competition. We've heard a lot about it in uh, for electric vehicles. <laughs> <laughs> so if you could elaborate, we hear more and more about uh, the Chinese threat or the Asian threat for trucks and vans. Is that uh, one of the reasons why you are you know, got so quickly together on this? And how do you see that panning out? And should the EU um, also uh, keep an eye out on that beyond the just the uh, passenger cars uh, threat? And then what's the name of the coffee brand you had in that office? Because <laughs> it was clearly persuasive. Joking. But <laughs> no, but I mean, do you know what? I, I think it's a very good and important question, obviously. Uh, but, but I mean, if I, if I start with Volvo, uh, we are a 50 billion euro company, global. We have 2% of our sales in Sweden. So 98% outside Sweden, we have 30% in, uh, in Europe. Uh, one thing that we have learned to Rudolf's uh, uh, sake here, you need to be best for real in the long run. Because if you are not competitive in the long run, you can have whatever protections that you like, but you will not be successful. Then it's a, so I mean, that is what we're going for. I mean, if we don't believe in this, that we could be uh, one of the really key players in this when it comes to decarbonization, when it comes to competitiveness, uh, when it comes to flexibility, when it comes to the solution end-to-end, -end, we should not go for it. I mean, we have a lot of different priorities when it comes to capital, resource and talent uh, allocations, all of us. But we truly believe in all these parameters. And we also know that this is a sector that we need to address. Then when it comes to competition, what we are advocating for as uh, I mean, free trade uh, friends is that it must be a level play field, regardless with what region you are talking about. And, and it is even more important now when it comes to decarbonization that we have I mean, a fair system when it comes, for example, input material, carbon, etc. But having said that, when we look at the potential, uh, we are of course aiming to, to meet any competitor, because if you are not ready to do that, you will not be. Uh, in in uh, other you words, you don't have the license to operate. If I put like Martin, that. in other words, you're not scared of Asian competition. No, I'm I'm I'm, I'm very humble. Uh, I'm uh, I'm um, a choleric mm -hmm. uh, about I mean uh, the competition uh, because you need to be extremely uh, uh, of course. I mean it's like standing in an escalator backwards. <laughs> if you're no, it is. If you're standing still, you're moving backwards. You need to move in a certain pace, you have to stand in the same position, and you m need to move quicker in order to, to make progress. Mm -hmm. And that is the same in all different segments for all of us, by the way. All of us are representing global businesses. We know what it means. We are taking that extremely seriously. But we should not stand here if we said, okay, we are, we are up for losing. Right. I, I can add, though, to... Work hard, mm -hmm. have fun, make history. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I think that uh, it's fair to say that, of course, uh, of course, Chinese competitors are very, very capable, et cetera, et cetera, Absolutely. in general. Uh, but it's also fair to say that in that segment, uh, you know, European um, still have um, an advantage. I mean, Renault is, uh, if you take the brand, Renault is a number one uh, commercial vehicle brand uh, in Europe. So it means that mm -hmm. our brand does a good job. We are one of the leaders. Uh, and in general, com European commercial vehicles are amongst the most sophisticated. Okay, if you look, uh, you know, commercial vehicle in Japan or commercial vehicle in US or commercial vehicle in China, compared to what we deliver today to the customer for a number of reasons or is history, even if I was kind of teasing them that they 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 were doing the same thing for 50 years, it's the the product itself in Europe. It's the most sophisticated. And now, if you think about the fact that we have that kind of competence, we accelerate, we do a pure native EV platform, but the most important thing is in the integration of the mm. software system mm. into mm. the European ecosystem. And that, that is going to, for sure, give us a little bit more room that we might have on other segments 
where we have bigger challenges, okay? So let's see it like this. Right. Without underestimating the potential, you know, <laughs> sure. what they could come up with, et cetera. But I think it's an environment where we kind of, you know, lead the game. Okay. All right. I, I we'll get back to the room. We have a question coming virtually. I, I think we have a question, online question from a media colleague, Celia. Yes. Hello. Uh, uh, you, you on mute. <laughs> oh, we don't have your sound. Hello, hello. Uh, I think, I think, she, okay. Can you open your mic? Microphone. Ah, brilliant. Hi. Hi, hi. Hi, I'm Celia Broncano for La Tribuna Automation. And who will be the productive capacity of the new vehicle be in the Sandoville plan? Uh, Will you focus on light commercial vehicles only, or, or are you thinking of increasing the commercial portfolio with a percentage of time? And also, you mentioned that you are looking for new investors. Is flexible negotiation with other big investors and partners actually? Get the question clear. <laughs> All right, so uh, uh, it's, not it's, not it's not very clear, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, the sound, but I don't know if you get the gist of part of it, if it's asking. Yeah, I mean, on the, on the, um, they were talking about capacity in Sandouville. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we, we, nev we never talk about that. Okay. Okay, so, All right. so we'll try to do, uh, you know, as much as we can and, and okay. we can sell, but uh, I think that the whole logic is, uh, you know, is on not only based on volume, is based on the business that is around the product. The second thing, uh, whether Probably. we want to do something Some else. Some investment than part? No, I don't no, know there's a, anything else than uh, vans, right? The no. project is centered right now on the, on the light commercial vehicle. Okay. Of course, we might have the possibility to extend the range, as uh, Martin was saying, also for other geography because they need different things. But let's not, let's not try right now to focus exactly. on what we have. It's already right. big job for, for Philippe and, uh, and, uh, and all the team. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, and the third mm -hmm. one is investors. We, I think we already said, right? That we, right. we would be welcoming. For me, the ideal scenario is uh, other people, other industrial partners that can participate to grow the business and have a long-term view on the thing okay. because this is a journey, right? Right. So we start from the product, we create the ecosystem around, we, we, you know, we'll probably, you know, be creating things with our shareholders. So, so if you have Fantastic. people on the table, can bring something new okay. to, to complementary to what then it makes sense to what uh, we are able to do. Then it makes sense. Okay. It's not it's not a question of money, mm. right? It's a question of, you know, right. sharing competences. Um, Celia, thank you for that question. Um, I'll, I'll get back to the room, but one more question online. Hopefully, the sound is better this time. We have Charlie. Charlie, over to you. Good morning. Thank you very much for your time today. Um, I just had a question regarding you know, the disruption. You've mentioned the modularity of the platform and your ambitions to disrupt the commercial vehicle sector. How far can you push that disruption in terms of what you think of that be? And could you launch passenger vehicles based on the van? Okay, we got... We, uh, it's, it's about the platform, the disruption. Maybe, uh, Philip, you were talking about that a little bit. Yeah. As we say, this platform has been designed as being only electric. So it's a native EV. It's not like you take an existing uh, ICE vehicle and you try to electrify it. And that gives you the possibility to optimize the platform much more, make it shorter for the same cargo capacity. Luca mentioned about the maneuverability. All those things come with having a native EV design. And this being said, this platform, as you see it, it can be, as Lucas said, expanded. You can va make variants on it. So it has the full power of being a robust skateboard, but with a lot of uh, variant possibilities mm -hmm. on it. Uh, Christian, you want to add yeah, something? Uh, I mean, oh, on the platform to supplement, you know, the, one of the important uh, requirements for the logistics is the floor height. And we have ensured that we are best in class on that. We have the best in class turning circle radius, as Luca mentioned, it's a B segment car turning circle radius. So we have looked into all the ergonomics of designing the platform that allows us to scale on sizes and ensure that the modularity is maintained throughout the line. Okay. Uh, and maybe yes, one Philip. thing to come back to the ergonomics. 
a lot of logistic companies see their drivers changing job after 12 to 18 months. So you have to imagine changing your whole workforce every 12 to 18 months. And if we can make our vehicle more easy to drive, more friendly for people who deliver 100 or 150 packages a day, and we can keep them longer on the job, that is much more value, much less disturbance in the customer's operation. Uh, Rodolf, I'm speaking or, under or, your, your or control learning, here. Or learning, Philippe, or, or the, the vehicle learning, yeah. because it knows the routes, it mm -hmm. knows how to, you know, you know yeah, exactly. when I have to charge, etc. This is also one thing. Because, yeah? Yeah, mm. yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that answers your question, Charlie. Yes, we have a question in the room. Yes, go Thank on. You. Uh, Denis Perron from the daily newspaper La Croix. A question to uh, Luca De Meo. Do you plan other partnerships with uh, other car manufacturers, for example, around uh, small cars? <laughs> this is not the subject of the day. <laughs> I know, a lot of but uh, it's uh, my question. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, honestly, a, I'm a very open guy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this. So... I, I, be I believe in these things, right? I think, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, it's also a way to get challenged, right? You you, you've, mm -hmm. you've heard that Rodolfo is you know, putting pressure on us as a shareholder. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I think it, it gets us better, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, of course, you can't do only this, right, in life. But uh, I think in some, in some segments and on some businesses where we have to learn or we have to get scale mm -hmm. or we have no solution alone, I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, even f I mean, from a Renault perspective, uh, you would have a Thierry Pieton here as a CFO. He would tell you about the, let's say, the, in the enormous transformation in terms of quality of capital allocation in, in Renault. He also comes from that. Mm -hmm. I mean, let, let's, let's, let's say the things that they are, right? Sometimes people like me, that we, we have to be creating a fun solution, right? Four years ago, three years, three, three and a half years ago, we actually didn't have the money to do that. But we had the idea, right? That's the reality of the thing. Now, of course, Renault is getting much better and it works, but when we had to do this, so we had to find solution. And my solution was Martin <laughs> first and then, and then Rudolf. But then you get into a thing and you understand that each company can bring mm -hmm. a lot. Of course. Uh, you know, that they have competence, they have a market, they become, become customer. That's the story of that. But we actually, didn't have the means to do that, of our ambition. Ambition was big, you know? Portmone was small. <laughs> 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 now it's different, but you know, <laughs> the thing started like this and I, I think it's great. And, it's, uh, and if we find other opportunity, we will do it. I think there is a challenge on small car. A-segment cars in Europe is going like this, right? They went uh, because of lack of product offer, lack of uh, real potential to, because of regulation, prices exploded. We, we used to sell cars, a segment at 10,000 euro, you know, electric, electric, uh, electric car, you know, small, uh, it's uh, actually double. So we have to find solution. Yeah. And Thank we'll you. find any way to do it. Okay? <laughs> Thank you, Luca. Okay, Thank sure. you, Luca. <laughs> Just reminding you, let's keep the questions to Flexis. Thank you. Uh, Sophie Fay from Le Monde. I have a question. Can you elaborate on the concept of skateboard? Is it... Um well, is it a new trend in the industry or a buzzword? Or, and my second question is Michelin, as an internal startup, uh, Watea, who is trying to electrify um, also vans, did you have discussions with them or plans with Michelin? I'll first elaborate about the skate. And uh, of course, uh, investment is, is a good, uh, good thing that we will have an oxygen to breathe. So as a skate, it is firstly, as I said, three important characteristics we are doing. It's not the fun word. It's really how you ground up, keep all the electrical vehicle in mind. So you are not going to do an uh, ice engine with uh, different floors. So it's a, it's a real flat floor. And we ensure that the engine is positioned in such a way that we have the best turning circle radius. And the third element is the floor height. With all this as, as a skateboard, uh, we are able to adapt to different body types. That means you move from a one type of uh, body to a second type of body. You don't do a lot of adjustment in the plant to do that. This is something very important on a skate. Is a lot of Lego in mind, Lego yeah. in industry, Lego in supply chain. Everything is Lego based. So that all the superstructure you build are able to be stitched in a seamless way in a robust way and with high durability because we make durable vehicles. Yeah. 
Thank you. And sure. coming to the investor portion. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I can comment just to say that you have a lot of companies who are now taking standard vans or standard electrified vans and trying to package them for ser some services to customers. But what we will have at Flexis is that we will have the vehicle and the service which are designed together so we don't have this difference between hardware and service. We are going to build all this into one integrated solution and the possibilities that the hardware gives, they will reinforce the service op offer <coughs> and vice versa. So that's a much more powerful combination. I think, Sophie, you asked on the, um, let's say, transformation of, uh, kind of, uh, transformation of uh, combustion van into electric van. Is that your, 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 the initiative of Michelin? Uh, yeah, it's part of Wattea. Ah. Who is designing software and captors to, um, to provide services to okay. uh, craftsmanship or, yeah. you know, people who yeah, use I mean, this. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of, it could be competition, could be, I mean, we were there together with the uh, with Michelin team a couple of weeks ago, no, three weeks ago. Mm. So we, we look at the thing, so it's a company with which we cooperate. Uh, if we see opportunities, I mean, I when you do something that is good for your customer, normally, you're never wrong. So we have to look at what is good for our customers. And then we'll, we'll try to find a solution. For sure, with the architecture, both mm -hmm. physical and software thing, mm -hmm. we have a lot of flexibility to adapt the product. And that's the thing. It's not the white box on wheels mm -hmm. with the diesel engine anymore. It's really some revolutionary product designed for that. Thank you, Thank you Luca. Um, but, but I think, I mean, on, on this is a very important question because if you think about the ecosystem, uh, uh, already on the heavy duty transports today, you have a very intense uh, ecosystem around the services, uptime, predictive maintenance, safety standard driving times, uh, battery surveillance systems, uh, since uh, these products are used to, to a very high extent, etc. Exactly. Charging, um, residual value guarantees, etc. Mm. So c customer finance, insurance. Everything is custom made. Uh, and I mean, if you take the Volvo example, we have more than 1.6 million connected units with our customers today. And the ecosystem is open. So if any company can provide services into that uh, software uh, stack, uh, of course it should be possible mm -hmm. because that's good for the customer's productivity or safety or decarbonization. That's number one. Number two on the hardware, I think, uh, on the commercial vehicles, which is super important in order to be successful, and that is where we are, so to speak, meeting, is the modularization, the Lego. And what is modularization? It is uh, that you define standardized interfaces in your, in, in your uh, architecture. And why standardized interfaces are important? Because between those standardized interfaces, you really can actually adapt to the specific need without losing scale where it matters. Because you want to have scale where it matters in the backbone, mm. uh, but you don't want to um, compromise the application excellence for the final customer. Because a van in this context that we're talking about for Flexis is a production equipment. It is not a car. These equipment are used. I mean, a car is used 3-4% of the available time. Mm -hmm. A van is used 60-70, and in these cases, op uh, obviously up to 80-85% of the time. Uh, so, so modularization in commercial vehicles is key, and that is what Krishnan and team uh, really, and, and the whole, of course, engineering team of Renault right. has done, and excelled mm -hmm. upon that you can create this platform and thereby doing the application excellence. Thank you, Martin. I'm also looking at the time. Maybe we have one final, or one or two more questions. We have one in the front row here. If we could pass in the mic, please. On the front row, lady. Yeah, thank you very much. Maybe one final one after that. Sorry? Yeah. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Liz Alderman with the New York Times. My question was actually going to be about the elephant in the room, which was, which was Asia, uh, which you all answered. But I guess a follow-up to that would be, to what extent uh, would you see, you've talked about the need to be highly competitive with these vehicles. Uh, to what extent do you see uh, this product possibly being able to penetrate the Chinese market? How could you be competitive in that huge market? And secondly, um, how can you uh, 
uh, stay also competitive with American companies, given the mass subsidies, for example, that we're seeing in the United States with the IRA, et cetera? Mm -hmm. What is being done by European governments to help guarantee the creation of a European champion on this? Maluk, I think, uh, I think, I mean, the structure, I, I speak under the control of Spezia, but the structure of the light commercial, uh, let's say, VECO, Chinese light commercial, is completely different from Europe. It's a lot of small things, a little bit like, maybe, of course, you have some few electric things, but it's not at all the same structure. So at this stage, there's no plan to go to China with Flexis because it's a product that is designed for such kind of ecosystem. We probably look more at more sophisticated markets, okay, in terms of that segment uh, with the more sophisticated, that absorb more sophisticated products than trying to find, uh, to fight, uh, you know, 8,000 euro small uh, electric uh, vehicle that you see dwelling around in the Chinese uh, city because this is the reality of the thing today. Um, regard the second question is a big question. I don't think we have the time in one minute <laughs> 25. But for sure, I don't know if you have seen, uh, you know, the, uh, let's say, the letter that I wrote to some of the potential saying it, it's, we need a strategy for that. Um, we're getting a lot of support, I have to say. I mean, Friday we were in, uh, in Sandouville and you have heard the uh, French Minister of Economy and, you know, you know, how, uh, you know, he was there and they're pushing and they're helping us, et cetera, et cetera. But there is in general a need for a strategy okay, uh, to, on how to make this kind of transition in Europe and not just a bunch of regulation that come every six months on, on, on our neck because that's part of the story, but we need a strategy. That uh, was our call also from the ASEA uh, side. Yes, yeah. and, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, it shouldn't be an excuse for people like us to only say that this thing doesn't work because the authorities are not doing the job right or they are not, I mean, it's not that they're not doing the job, but there is no uh, kind of plan like you, for example, see it in China. So it shouldn't be an excuse. That's why I think you have to see this project as an initiative, a proactive initiative of a bunch of people, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, that are trying to find solutions for our customer and to push the European uh, economy. And for the, the, for the American competitors that they want to come in that segment uh, to play in Europe, the market is open and will say, <laughs> please come. But, but I think what is interesting about the European versus American strategy, and we should not prolong it because, as Lucas said, uh, but I think a, a specific element when it comes to commercial vehicles in, in US that is interesting, I talked about, I mean, the brown to a green platform and what they are doing through IRA, if we just disregard, I mean, uh, when it comes to the competition, uh, is that they are actually addressing the whole value chain and in particular the demand signals because that is very important that you're getting, so to speak, the transporters and the transport buyers on board with a demand signal because otherwise you will not pull the ecosystem when it comes to scaling up in terms, not only about equipment, by the way, but also in terms of charging infrastructure, refueling mm -hmm. if it's hydrogen, etc. So I, I think we need to think about how do we drive the demand signal mm. uh, since we have a regulatory landscape that today is just based on uh, the OEMs to get the volumes out, but the volumes will not get out if we don't have a demand a signal coming in, or real demand, basically, orders coming in. So, so there I think uh, they have been rather uh, smart in the construct of, of uh, uh, we have of looked at the, We have looked at Riviano, we have looked at uh, you know, Bright Drop, we have looked at Arrival, etc. Mm -hmm. We've seen this kind of, it was an inspiration for us, and mm -hmm. I think we learned a lot from uh, all of them. Right. For, for all of them, and we kind of, Chewing that and you know and bringing our, I mean, a hundred years experience mm -hmm. on commercial vehicle. I don't know how many years it's a Volvo. On. Yeah, one hundred. <laughs> <We're> <laughs> but if if we count Berlin, also is even more actually. Right. Yeah. And I think I think that will be the final question. That's all the time we have. It's it's going to be a great adventure, and hopefully it inspires others to do the same. Mm -hmm. But you have two years, two or three years advance, two right? Years, yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It was great to be part of this. Enjoy lunch and see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>